Welcome to TD Physics and thank you for joining me today. We're going to be learning about compass bearings through the course of this video. But before we get to that, I want to thank you for joining me in this adventure of grade 11 physics here in Ontario. One of the passions I have beyond physics is history. This button right here is a World War I button that people who enlisted in World War I or who were drafted would wear to show that they were in. Thank you for being in with me. It takes courage and I appreciate your coming on this journey with me. A story before we get to the physics. This British war medal belonged to Barney Handraham, and it's in my possession because his family, at some point along the way, forgot about him and his service. Barney Handraham was born on Christmas Day, 1890, and he was likely Irish. His dad's name was Patrick, and we know that from his records that he was about five foot eight and that his eyes were brown, his hair was dark brown, uh, his sight was good, his hearing was good. We know an awful lot about these soldiers. One of the other things we know is that after being forced to join the army, uh, he manages to arrive around March 24th. That's where he arrives out east and is sailing over to England and gets there uh, a little bit later, a bit of a long, long haul on the ship. But more importantly, he's reported missing with just a little bit of time left in the war, about a month and a half left, and he would have made it. And he died in the last 100 days push with the uh, Quebec 14th Battalion, uh, fighting relatively close to where my great-grandpa, uh, Fort Edwards, fought in World War I as well. He is buried in a British cemetery over in northern France, and these things are beautifully maintained by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. And if you look up the details on exactly where he's buried, and look carefully on the plan, you find out that he's buried at the far back corner here, against the back wall, uh, around 20 graves in. Private Handraham was in the infantry, and one of the essential skills for infantrymen was the ability to navigate, and compasses were an essential part of that. Uh, this is a prismatic compass. A version of this is also used by scuba divers underwater. And learning how to measure our angles during the time of war so you can get to one place or another, and in particular to direct artillery fire, was an essential skill for the infantry. All soldiers, actually. And so we're going to go look at some basics of how to articulate angles. I presume that by now you are familiar with the, uh, the NESW. I remember the order of never enter stinky washrooms. Um, when we are writing out our angles, say we want to go north 30 degrees east. Okay. And in physics, we'll be indicating directions of many things using little square brackets like this. So if I want to indicate north 30 degrees east, that means that I need to start with the first letter, and that should normally be a north or a south. Although sometimes I suppose you could write east or west first, but north and south is more common. We would start measuring from the base right here, and we would measure 30 degrees from north. And so that would be somewhere in this ballpark right about here. So what north 30 degrees east means is that it starts at north. You measure 30 degrees in the direction of east. Similarly, if we wanted to do, say, uh, south 15 degrees west, then what we would do for that is we would start at south and we would count up 15 degrees. Again, that would mean that we're starting at south. That's our, our beginning location is south. And we're moving 15 degrees towards west. And so we got a couple examples on your handout sheet from today. So we're going to go to that sheet now. The reason this is important is that when we combine the directions that you've been learning about with how far we've gone from our original starting point, together we call those displacement. So let's practice a couple more directions. So north 30 degrees east. Okay, so we'll do a few of these together and then uh, you'll have four that you will uh, record for a neighbor to practice and uh, tomorrow during homework time 
um, you'll get to exchange that with another person in class. So north 30 degrees east, we've already done something similar to that down below. And so that would be something like that. So north, and again, you should have counted 30 degrees towards east from north. North 40 degrees west, that would be starting from the same starting point of north, but this time we're going to count towards west, and we're going to count 40 degrees this time. So 10, 20, 30, 40 degrees. And so that's going to be 40 degrees in here. And if we're going to do south 45 degrees east, that's our next one on the example right here. Remember, you can always pause and slow things down. So south, we're starting from the southern axis right here. And we're going to count our way halfway all the way to east. And so somewhere in that ballpark right here. There we go. So halfway in between. So we've counted, I guess you could technically count both directions, but we've counted 45 degrees from south going towards east. And then finally, south 15 degrees west will be something to this effect. Okay. And again, I recognize those that are noticing the, uh, the, the fine tuning uh, that measures all my angles from the easterly direction. Um, this is plus or minus a degree or so. So at this point, um, as part of your home time, uh, you've got some blanks here. Uh, ideally, pause the video. And then what you're going to do is give these ones a try right here. Um, but the answers are going to be coming, well, right now, after you unclick pause. Welcome back. So again, north 10 degrees east would be something in this ballpark right there. North 80 degrees west, starting at north and counting almost all the way over to west. So there we go. South 63 degrees east. That is south. We're counting towards the east. And so we've counted up to somewhere in this ballpark. And then south 22 degrees west. Counting up 10, 20 degrees in this direction or so, and a bit more, 22 degrees. Something like that. So if your answers are somewhere in that ballpark, you are in the right neighborhood, and you're doing well. So the first piece for you, testing your neighbor, or as close as neighbors are, in 2020, and when this video is being produced, um, make up four of your own. Please start your directions on north or south, and then the number of degrees, and then your final letter should be east or west. So besides being something that you need to know for physics, when are we ever going to use this? Or when has it ever been applicable? Well, when you get to use it is coming soon. Historically, the application, I'm going to give you a short clip from the Australian or the Anzacs from World War I. This is a public domain video that they produced. This is what some of those who came before us 100 years ago had to do. I've used applications of this in the bush, not to call in artillery fire, but to find myself on a map. But more on that later. Here you go, a blast from the past from the government of Australia from 100 years ago. How to use a compass to call in artillery. Here's another example of the use of the compass in action. This platoon commander, from his forward position, spots the flash of an enemy mortar. He takes the bearing of its position, 20 and a half degrees. His compass is correct. The platoon commander, we will call him A, passes a message through company headquarters to battalion headquarters. Enemy mortar position, 20 and a half degrees magnetic from 278639. This message goes to the battalion intelligence officer. Enemy mortar position, 20 and a half degrees magnetic from 278639. The first thing he must do is to convert this magnetic bearing to a grid bearing. From the bottom margin of the map, he sees that the magnetic variation in 1942 was 10 degrees west of grid north, annual decrease 10 minutes. Assuming that it is now four years later, the variation to the nearest half degree 
is nine and a half degrees. So he converts the magnetic bearing to a grid bearing by subtracting nine and a half degrees. Grid bearing, 11 degrees. Now, with his protractor, he plots grid bearing 11 degrees on the map from map reference 278639. The enemy mortar position must be at some point along this line. Another platoon commander, whom we will call B, also spots the flash from the same mortar and takes a bearing on it. 110 and a half degrees from position B. His compass has an error of one degree west of magnetic north. So he sends a message back, enemy mortar position, 109 and a half degrees magnetic from 261651. This message also goes back to the battalion intelligence officer. The magnetic bearing of 109 and a half degrees is converted to a grid bearing of 100 by subtracting nine and a half degrees as before. This second grid bearing is plotted on the map from map reference 261651. The enemy mortar position must be somewhere along this line. So it must be at the point of intersection of the two grid bearing lines. Map reference 279648. This procedure, the taking of bearings from two known positions, in order to find the position of a third unknown point, is called intersection. The nearer the two bearings from the known position make to a right angle, the more accurate will be the position of the third point plotted. For instance, here are bearings taken from two known points, A and B. They intersect, making a right angle, at point C. Now suppose that we allow a possible error of one degree west and east in the bearing taken or plotted from point A, and a similar possible error from point B. Point C may now lie anywhere within this small lozenge-shaped piece of ground. Now suppose the two bearings are taken and plotted from two points, A and B, closer to each other. In this case, the angle formed at the point of intersection is 30 degrees. And you can see that the size of the lozenge is increased, giving a much larger area of possible error on the ground for the same possible error of one degree east or west made in the bearings. If the error in the bearings is increased to a possible two degrees east and west, you see that a very much larger possibility of error on the ground is produced. If the angle between the bearings is increased to a right angle once more, the area of error is still considerable, but it is materially less than it was with the bearings making an angle of 30 degrees. So remember, the nearer the bearings make to a right angle, the more accurate is the position of the intersection plotted by them. The greater the variation from a right angle, the greater is the possibility of error on the ground. Thanks for watching. Know your physics, know your history.